This week at the movies, a 3D animated children's movie with a whole bunch of celebrity voices. What will they think of next? It's Despicable Me starring Steve Carell. No! Oh, I hate that guy. Also coming up this week... How do we kill them however you can? Is Adrian Brody tough enough to take on the creature that rumbled with Arnold Schwarzenegger back in the day? Find out when we review Predators. Come give us a hug before you go. Hugs. Hug her, that's what she's there for. We reviewed The Kids Are All Right on last week's show, but we love it so much we're talking about it again. Plus, movies that try to put the fun in dysfunction. In our Over Under segment, we look at the state of indie comedy. I want, I want. You will not cry, or whine, or laugh, or giggle. Or sneeze, or barp, or fart. So no, no, no annoying sounds, right? Does this count as annoying? <sighs> Can three adorable little girls melt the heart of a diabolical villain? What do you think? I'm Michael Phillips of the Chicago Tribune. And I'm A.O. Scott, diabolical villain of the New York Times. <laughs> you darn well are. Our first movie is Despicable Me. After the tasteful restraint of Pixar's approach to 3D animation, it's refreshing to see an animated feature that's not ashamed to throw stuff at your head over and over as if to say you paid for the 3D upcharge now. Duck! Based on this film's marketing campaign, you'd think it was about a lot of little yellow creatures who don't look despicable in the least. Turns out they're the lab assistants of a would-be supervillain named Gru, voiced by Steve Carell, in full Boris Badenov mode. Gru, who lives in the shadow of a more successful supervillain named Vector, plans to steal the moon using that shrink ray. Maybe that'll impress his witch of a mother. Just so you know, Mom, I am about to do something that is very, very big, very important. When you hear about it, you're going to be very proud. Ah, good luck with that. Okay, I'm out of here. And maybe not. First half of the movie is unfocused, chaotic, and only occasionally funny. Then, just when you're about to give up on it, the story starts focusing on Gru's adoption of three orphan girls. Will you read us a bedtime story? Oh, fine. All right. All right. Sleepy kittens. Sleepy kittens. Three little kittens love to play. They had fun in the sun all day. Wow, this is garbage. You actually like this? And against all odds, the sentimental stuff in this movie is what works. I enjoyed the second half of Despicable Me, enough to forgive the overcrowded first half, and to say mildly, Tony, see it. I say see it for the second well, half. Well, I think you've described everything that's, that's wrong with it, which is that it's stuffed with all of this stuff. You know, it's got the cute little minions, and it's got the mad scientist sidekick, uh, who's voiced by Russell Brand. It's got the villain. It's got the big 3D effects yes, throwing yes, things yes. at you. And then it... It imports this sort of heart tugging heart, these three little cute little orphans. No, who are no, no, okay, melt, I, I, and, I, I, and I just I think it's I, well, all completely well, phony. You wouldn't, you know, your heart is unmeltable anyway. But I, I honestly think if you laid it out on paper and you thought, okay, the introduction of these orphan girls is what's going to give this movie its heart, that sounds like a cynical ploy. It does not play that way. It sounds it, like no, it no, is no, a cynical ploy. No, 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 ploy. no, because that's where the good material is. When you have scenes like Steve Carell yeah, as, as Gru reading the bedtime stories and sort of equivalent with the material, and, and I think that actually that stuff plays because Carell was how to play it. The voice actors are, yes, better than the material, but they're good enough to kind of guide this movie to its, its second half, and that's where the movie kind of takes care no, of itself. No, I don't think so, because then you, it keeps throwing in all of these, you know, more action sequences and bigger and bigger effects. This seemed to me exactly the kind, um, it's interesting you brought up Pixar had said this is refreshing in comparison to well, Toy Story 3. Well, I, I, I'm a little ironic <laughs> there, okay? <laughs> no, but it, I, it's, I would, not, it's not up to Toy Story 3 this level. Is, this is a, a, a typically desperate, dumbed-down, overfilled no, children's entertainment. No, 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 it's better than that. I think, uh, and you hated Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs, no? Yes. This is a little better than that, I think. And, it, and There's that, a ringing endorsement. Yeah, yeah, no, no, points. hold on. Okay. No, but but it, ha it has that sort of like, you know, yes, it's coming at your head all the time. Yes. You have to take it on that level, I think. And I'll, on that grant level you, I'll grant you a little better than Cloudy with a Chance okay, of Meatballs. Great, great. But I still say skip it. <laughs> Next up, in a summer full of remakes, reboots, and reimaginings, we get a movie that's a little of all three. This time, it's Predators, a reworking of a sturdy old sci-fi suspense franchise in which human beings are hunted for sport by alien monsters. The new version, directed by Nimrod Antal, starts out strong with Adrian Brody plummeting through the air in a free fall that may or may not be a metaphor for his post-Oscar career. Where are we? Maybe she knows.
That's Alice Braga as yeah. the only woman in a group of eight ethnically diverse Earthlings who spend the suspenseful and sometimes funny first third of the movie trying to figure out just what's going on. They're all warriors with violent pasts, with the exception of the doctor, played by Topher Grace. Excuse me, I'm just what the hell is going on here? We're being hunted. We're all brought here for the same purpose. This planet is a game preserve. And we're the game. Once the monsters show up and the struggle for survival gets underway in earnest, the movie bogs down in howling, disemboweling, and lumbering chases. But Antal is a good enough action director that some of the combat is pretty exciting, and the characters, who are just meat to their would-be predators, are just vivid enough to make predators worth renting. Yeah, we're sort of swapping uh, ringing <laughs> endorsements here uh, from the first film. I say skip it. I wanted to like it more, Tony. And I like the first Predators, mm -hmm. and I like much of the first half of this because, as you say, this whole idea, of, it's, it's really kind of like uh, a season of loss yeah. sort of jammed in together because you, you really don't know dumber. where they are. Dumber, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I just felt that this was a film where, at the midpoint, when they introduced the Lawrence Fishburne character, you think, great, good actor, interesting reveal, and then from there, on you had you had it got more and more confined and claustrophobic and kind of flatter just as as an action picture so I, I, I was with I, it for the first half, but no, I not, the second half, just slowly deflating more and more and more. I don't entirely enough. disagree, but I thought, you know, good enough for, for a rental. I thought, actually, Adrian Brody, once again, as he did in Splice, which is a much better movie, one that we liked, really kind of throws himself into this genre B-movie material well, like with a great cast. deal of conviction. The, the, cast is, the cast is not the issue here. I just think, I think it, it's a shame that a film that has kind of a good, expansive, open-air feel in the first half, and we don't really know what's up with these predators yet. <laughs> And then it just gets to be kind of like an aliens knockoff where you're stuck inside the metal hull of a ship yeah. and the action just is not interesting enough. Well, and there's always the problem of once the monsters show up, it all becomes much more literal and much less scary yeah, than no. when you're looking around the jungle trying to figure out what's I agree. watching you. And I say skip it. <laughs> Coming up next, we introduce you to the angriest man in the world in a documentary that I think is worth your time. I have no relationship with you two. Meet Innovation. Money. What the f was that? Son of a bitch. I gotta read it again because my mind is just a piece of Time to take a look at some smaller movies now in theaters. That was a clip from the documentary Winnebago Man. This is a movie about uh, a, a guy who's become kind of an internet celebrity described as the angriest man in the world because way back in the late 80s, before there was an internet, he was shooting an industrial video for Winnebago trailers and somebody collected the outtakes, his profane, ranting, raving, explosions of frustration, packaged them together into a tape that had a cult following. So the filmmaker, the documentary maker, goes to try to find this guy and to figure out what it all means. Yeah, and where he is, if he's alive, I mean, right. he doesn't even know this. And, and yeah, you go on YouTube now, and it's two million hits, 5,000 comments. It's become this sort of viral sensation. I like this film a lot, Tony, and I think not just because the outtakes themselves are in, indeed hilarious, but <laughs> because they're kind of relatably hilarious. I, I remember a show earlier this season where I had at least as much trouble getting through the copy. <laughs> but uh, yeah. I, but uh, I, I, think, I think this idea of like finding out if this subject, this sort of dubious phenomenon is still around, where is he? And it, it turns out he's become this hermit in Northern California. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I, know, I know this film deals on sort of a fine line of humiliation and admiration, well, see, I but, I like, I, but I thought I it pulled it, it off. I think it crossed the line. I think this is a disingenuous and shallow movie about a fairly interesting guy. And I agree, those clips of him blowing his stack again and again in his crisp white shirt and, and tie have a sort of pathos and humor. But I think Do you that, find the whole thing mean-spirited? I, I felt that, that the filmmaker went after this guy without really knowing what he was looking yeah, for. Yeah, true enough. And then also persuaded himself that he was protecting this guy's dignity when in fact he was doing the opposite. And Rebney kind of plays along so. in no, a good no, humored no. way, but I, I just thought they should have just left him alone. He I, wants I, to be alone. No, no, I, Leave him no, alone. Gave me a just queen, because no, no. the internet is showing everyone on video all the time doesn't make it okay. I think, I think the film is less mean-spirited than that. I think it's actually smarter and, and funnier than that. I think so, it's hypocritical. No. I, say I, say I, say I, I say skip it, but do check out the okay. YouTube video. Also in theaters, The Girl Who Played With Fire. Tony, this is the middle of three 
stories in right. the Stig Larsson trilogy that uh, started with The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, huge international publishing phenomenon. Yes. Uh, the films are very successful overseas as well. Uh, this one I felt roughly as I did about the first one, which I was a skip it on the we, first one. We were one. both skip it on Yeah, the first and one. I got to say, I was probably a little hard on that. I, it's more of a rent it now, I think, in retrospect. Yeah, yeah a slight. You've, you've, uh, you've, grown, you've mellowed in I've your old age. I've evolved into the skip it. It's honestly, it's because I think this actress, Numi Rapace, who plays the uh, main character, Elizabeth yeah. Salander, who is this fascinating computer hacker character, yeah. uh, and in this film, investigating. Uh, well, she's being f framed for murder of journalists who are investigating a sex trafficking well, ring, and that's this is this is the thing. It's all about sexual exploitation, right. and uh, the question kind of hang over it is: Is she a feminist avenging angel, well, or it, is it, it all I, exploitation? I, I, I think she is, and I think that this movie is less um, exploitative in its own way. One of the problems that we both had, I think, with the first one is how graphic and gruesome and cruel the depictions of violence are. Yeah. This movie doesn't shy away from the fact that there is this horrible violence, much of it directed against women in the world, but it doesn't have to show you every single minute and kind of rub your face in it. Right. Also, I think that the fact that this movie focused much more on her, on Salander and on her life and her past, rather than getting bogged down in a whole other kind of murder she wrote crime story, makes it better. Yeah, so I, I, I thought, I, the, I, on I thought this the plotting was horsey, though. Why didn't you like it better? I mean, why, why, not, a, not a see it for you? Why? No, it's a, it's, a, it's a rented just because it's like, it's like a pretty good episode of a pretty good TV show. Yeah. Last but not least, a very strange, interesting disturbing film from Greece, the festival curiosity Dogtooth. Το ζώο που μας απειλεί λέγεται γάτα. Είναι το πιο επικίνδυνο ζώο που υπάρχει. Με τα νύχια του ξεσκίζει το θύμα του και στη συνέχεια με τα κοφτερά της δόντια τρώει το πρόσωπο και μετά όλο το σώμα. Also, now this movie takes a little bit of, of explaining. It's about this family, this wealthy Greek family, where the mother and father have raised their three children who are uh, older teenagers or maybe early twenties. No, they're 20s. older than that. They're like almost they're, thirty. I mean, yeah, yeah, and in, in in this kind of hothouse environment where they're taught the wrong words for different things, where they have this bizarre incestuous dynamic among the three of them. Um, it's beautifully shot. The director, um, Giorgios Lamintos, has an amazing way of framing these odd, sensual, creepy little yeah. scenarios. And, and, and I like the way how this feels. I like this film quite a bit, Tony. I, I, uh, I, 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 I like it um, sort of as a curiosity, but I do like no, it. I, like, and I, think, I think for a long time you're, you're kind of asked to guess, you know, what is going on with the dynamic of this family? Why are, the, why are these adult children confined to the house? And it, it's, you know, it, it's, it's the kind of theme and the sort of absurd black comedy, very harsh edge, that you find a lot in literature and the stage. You don't see it much in the movies, and I yeah. think this was pulled off very well. I, I like it. You cannot recommend it lightly because it's disturbing, <laughs> but it's good. It is, it is disturbing. I thought it was uh, the idea was a little unfocused. Like I, I got that it was some kind of allegory, but I found myself very frustrated about what it was supposed you to be. You like allegory. things laid out, Tony. I need Ooh. things explained to me. I'm a little, I'm very literal minded. Coming up next, the best movie for grown ups in months is finally here. It's The Kids Are All Right, starring Annette Benning and Julianne Moore. I feel like he's taking over my family. Each of my moms had a kid with your sperm. Like in both of them. Uh-huh, like in gay. Right on. Cool, I, I, uh, I love lesbians. Great. Last week, Tony and I couldn't wait to tell you about a wonderful new movie called The Kids Are All Right. Well, it opens this weekend, and however or whenever you catch up with it, do. It stars Annette Benning and Julianne Moore as longtime companions raising two teenaged kids in L.A. Behind their mom's backs, the kids contact their sperm donor birth father, played by Mark Ruffalo. Did you, uh, did you ever play any sports in school? Well, the whole team thing just got on my nerves after a while. You know, I was like, hey, let's go kick some ass, man. And, and uh, <laughs> what about you? Uh, I, I play soccer, uh, basketball, baseball, you know, all the team sort of sports. Okay. That's the scene where the kids, played by Mia Vasakovska and Josh Hutcherson, meet their birth father. It's a little bit awkward, a little bit funny, and entirely persuasive. It's primarily a comedy, though, a heartfelt, sexy, and soul-satisfying portrait of an unconventional family. I seem to have turned into a total blurbmeister on this one. Ah, to hell with it. See it. It is, well, it bears, it is, so, it repeating. It yeah. is such a relief, Tony, after some of these months we've been through, of just <laughs> sort of formulaic, big-budget stuff that just isn't as good as it should be, and, and then along comes this. Well, yeah, and you see a lot of so-called comedies um, that 
just completely get away from the idea of depicting, trying to depict people as they actually are. And on, this actually planet, on this on planet, on this planet, yes, yes. And this is so perfectly humanly scaled. So it's like, you could know these people. They, they could be your sisters, your aunts, your neighbors. They're so familiar and so lovingly portrayed, but with just enough of, of sort of satiric acidity etched in there that, that, that you laugh at them um, yes, without, right. but not contemptuously No, I think, and, and Laurel Canyon, which was uh, Cholonico's previous film, was yeah. set in sort of a different corner of L.A. and sort right. of like on the margins of the music biz. And this is a whole different sort of part of it, but she's becoming kind of one of the great chroniclers of this city, really back to the Paul Mazursky films of the 70s, where yeah. you got this sort of wonderful series of portraits of L.A. That's what we have here, and I, I just, I just, I'm really in the and, back and, of this and, Well, because <laughs> every character in it, um, I mean, obviously, Benning and, and more characters primarily, but also the Mark Ruffalo character, who's this kind of wild card who rides in on his motorcycle and shakes up this family, yeah. but also the kids, Mia Wasikowska and Josh Hutcherson, terrific performances. Terrific, yes. It's so easy to caricature teenagers in movies, to show them as, as either no. rudderless or goody two right. shoes, yeah. and Sometimes these kids are as real as everyone else. No, and your heart goes out to both them. All five of these main characters are just are absolutely three dimensional, and you just the rooting interests are strong and honest, and they don't feel rigged up by the screenplay. Yes, indeed. Coming up next, is this a quirky country or what? We look at some of the most over and underrated indie comedies of recent years. Are you okay? No, I'm not okay. Offbeat families, uncomfortable situations, humor that's quirky and ironic instead of broad and side-splitting. The Kids Are All Right is an indie comedy we like a lot, and it got us thinking about some other examples for our Over Under segment this week. Okay, so this what is the got? eccentric American family is kind of a staple of the American indie movement, especially yes. as they come out of the Sundance Film Festival and kind of, yes. you, know, as, uh, you know, matriculate into the, the culture, right? I think, for my money, the, the, the overrated film in this category that was a huge hit, and I don't mind it, but it's Little Miss Sunshine, mm. and I, I, that, that's a film where I thought the cast absolutely bailed out what was, you know, a, a workable and clearly appealing comedy for most people, but I never believed... Tony, on some gut level, that any of these people belong to the same family. Really? Well, see, because I, 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 I have one thing I have to say is I've known a lot of suicidal gay Proust scholars in my life, and no one, and no you one, see a lot no of that one, kind of thing and in And Carell movies. really nailed he it. Really Steve nailed. Carell. Okay, okay so, what's, so that's what? my over. I don't hate it, but I think it's okay. overrated. Under. Underrated, a film called June Bug, mm -hmm. which uh, works on a premise that other films have worked from where you have, you know, sort of the town mouse comes home to the country <laughs> mice. Right. His family goes, goes back home to the family in North Carolina, and it's kind of how different factions of family kind of yeah. recombine and meet again and it's uh, for my money it, it's a film that uh, was not critically underrated but it was underrated by the audience mm -hmm. because it didn't it, found it, what it, it needed. And it was a movie though that that uh, in which a lot of people discovered Amy Adams who's now become uh, a, a big movie star and she is the star of my overrated um, indie comedy, which, which is, is Sunshine Cleaning, which I thought should have been called Sundance Recycling, because <laughs> it came out, I think, the year after Little Miss Sunshine was a big hit, and it has, it also has Alan Arkin in it, you know, playing the eccentric dad, grandpa figure, and this one is all of the, which, it, this one was kind of a hit, too. And, and Emily Blunt. And was, Emily Blunt, good, good cast, good but, then, like, yeah. completely phony, artificial, condescending to a totally fake version of small town America. <laughs> Couldn't stand this one. My okay. underrated, underrated one, again liked by critics, not beloved enough by audience, is, is Tamara Jenkins, The Savages. Uh -huh. Philip Seymour Hoffman and Laura Linney as a brother and sister dealing with it, an, an older father <laughs> who's, 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 who's declining. Um, really, really wonderful, sharp, literate, witty, very good. terrific. Sad. These are sad films in many ways, but, yes. but they're, also, they're, they're very well, astute, com I think. Comedy is, is fundamentally sad. <laughs> For an extended discussion of the state of independent film today, which may also be somewhat sad, go to atthemovies.tv.com and click on Web Exclusives. Coming up next, three movies from <laughs> This week's show, Make Mine Three to See. Hotel provided by Park Hyatt Chicago. Chicago's award-winning hotel and luxury dining experience. Located in the heart of Chicago's magnificent mile on Water Tower Square. From the despicable to the delightful, here's my three to see. No remakes, no sequels. Number three, Despicable Me, a 3D animated feature that doesn't start out like much, but by the end, both kids and their alleged adult guardians should be entertained. Number two, Winnebago Man, a funny and touching documentary about an unlikely internet celebrity. And number one, by a mile, the funny, bittersweet, and altogether beguiling indie, The Kids Are All Right, which, if you look it up in the big book of antonyms, is the opposite of Despicable. 
That's it for now. We'll leave you with a recap of this week's show. Now you can join the discussion by following us on Facebook and on Twitter. Just go to atthemoviestv.com to find out how. Join us next week for reviews of Inception with Leonardo DiCaprio and The Sorcerer's Apprentice with Nicolas Cage. And until then, we'll be at the movies.